It's always a honor to be here, but today was very special. Thank you for those very kind words. Thank you for the chizuk that you give me. Um, I know the women here have a thirst for Torah, for chizuk, so it's worth the two and a half hour drive to come here. But this year, it was only an hour drive because I had a shiur in Muncie last night. So it was much easier, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> we began the book of Devarim this past Shabbat. Moshe Rabbeinu gave the Jewish people his final words of rebuke before he passed away. And one of the first things he told them was, it was an 11 day journey from Har Sinai to Eretz Yisrael and Rashi brings down Hashem desired the people so much He wanted them together with Him in the land of Israel and He was mitlabetet bishvilchem lemaher he gave them kipisat haderech. Instead of 11 days, it was 3 days. But Moshe tells them, Re'u ma garamtem. Look what you caused. Your sins caused 40 years, a 40 year delay. Hashem wants us. He desires us. He wants to give us blessing. He wants to be close to us. It is only our sins that stop Him from doing what He wants. There is nothing more that He desires than us, His precious children. It says, David HaMelech made a mizmor about the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash. Mizmor le David, Ba'u goyim nahalatecha. And the Gemara asks, You made a mizmor? What is it, a song? Hashem destroyed the Bet HaMikdash? Why are you singing a song? It should be a kinah, it should be a lamentation. And the Gemara says, No, it's a song. You know why? Because Hashem took out His wrath on etzim va'avanim, on sticks and stones, rather than His precious people. So I saw Rab Shmuel Birnbaum Zatzal. He says, you call the Bet HaMikdash sticks and stones? We're talking about the holiest place in the entire world. Sticks and stones? And he said, yeah. In comparison with the Jewish people, even the Bet HaMikdash is just sticks and stones. We are Hashem's pride and joy. The Bet HaMikdash is a representation of the closeness that Hashem has to us. When we fix ourselves, of course it's going to come back. We are what matters. The Gemara says in Masechet Gitin that when Titus Harasha came in, to destroy the Bet HaMikdash, he walked into the holiest place in the world, the Kodesh Kodashim, a place that no Jew was allowed ever except the Kohen Gadol on the holiest day of the year on Yom Kippur after seven days preparation and they didn't know if he would make it out alive. And Titus Harasha walks into the Kodesh Kodashim and he takes a Sefer Torah and he spreads it out across the floor and he takes a zona and commits an act of harlotry right there in that makom kadosh. It makes our stomach turn. What a, what a disgusting thing. Yet, Rav Chaim Velazhina writes in the Nefesh HaChaim, do you know what's worse than that? What could possibly be worse than this act? He says every time, even the simplest Jew makes one sin is much worse than that. What? A 
one sin is worse than what he did? Says Rav Chaim Velazhener, you have no idea the impact that we Jewish people have in this world. It says we were created B'Selem Elohim. What does B'Selem Elohim mean? We know Hashem doesn't have any image. Says Rav Chaim Velazhena, Hashem is called the Baal HaKohot Kulam. Everything is connected to Him. He runs the upper worlds, He runs the lower worlds. We all have the same power. Hashem gave us the power. We're connected to the upper worlds. We're connected to the lower worlds. When we do any deed, the effects we have in the universe are not to be believed. Titus Harasha has no influence anywhere. One Jewish person's thoughts is more impactful than anything this Rasha could ever do. This is the value of us. This is the value of one pure thought, one good intention, one nice smile, one word of chizuk. And especially during these days, the days before Mashiach, somebody once came to the Hafez Chaim and he said, it says in the Zohar that for Hashem to accept our mitzvot, they have to be done with Yir'ah, with Ahava, with Kavana. He says, how is Hashem going to accept our mitzvot? We, we're not like those previous generations that had all the right Kavanot. Hafez Chaim said, I'll explain, to you, I'll explain it to you with a story. I once met a baker and I asked the baker how business is, how life is. And he said, Rabbi, it's so hard. Sometimes I'm up all night preparing the, the bread for the next day. And when the customers finally come in, all they do is complain. This roll is too hard. This one's too round. This one's not square enough. This one's underdone. This one's overdone. And then when they ask how much it is and I tell them the price, they go to my competitor and they don't even buy. It's so hard. I saw this man, said the Chafetz Chaim, after World War I broke out. And he looked so happy. I said, what are you so happy about? He said, Rabbi, business is great. I said, why? He said, nobody cares about anything. They just want the bread. They'll buy it. They don't go to my competitor. They don't ask any questions about the price. They don't care if it's underdone. They just need bread because it's a time of war. Hafez Chaim said to this man, now at this point in history, there's a raging battle. It is not like the days of yesteryear. The Yetzer Hara is dancing in the streets. It's a time of war. And in a time of war, Hashem takes everything. Anything we give Him, He loves. The Chafetz Chaim said this in the 1900s, in the early 1900s. What would He say today? The battle that we're facing with the Yetzer Hara. Everything we do is so valuable. Every little hidur, every little blocking out the negative influences, one extra, everything we do matters. And now is the time to capitalize because soon it's going to be too late. Another man, young boy, said to the Chafetz Chaim, he said, Rabbi, it's so hard for me to serve Hashem. The Yetzer Hara, he's too difficult. I can't wait for the days of Mashiach. Then it'll be easy to serve Hashem. I'll be able, I'll be able to serve Him the way I want. And then I'll be able to pass and get reward. And the Chafetz Chaim told him, not so fast. It says, excuse me, in Kohelet, he quoted the Pasuk. 
והגיעו שנים שתאמר אין לי בהם חפץ. The Gemara says days are coming when we will no longer be able to acquire merits because at that time the Yetzer Hara is going to be abolished. There will be no more obstacles and we will not deserve reward because it will be too easy. It is only now when the battle is raging that we can truly gain from our mitzvot. But there's a question on this story, on this pasuk. The Rambam writes, Our greats did not yearn for Mashiach in order so that they could rule over the world or that they could eat, drink, and be merry. Rather, they wanted Mashiach so they could be free to learn Torah and earn merits and acquire the world to come. How do we understand this Rambam? In the days of Mashiach, there's no more Yetzer Hara. How could he say our greats yearned Mashiach so they can sit and learn and acquire Olam Haba? The Maharal in his Sefer Netzach Yisrael Perek Mem Vav brings the Ramban in Parashat Netzavim and answers. He says it is true when the Yetzer Hara is taken away we will no longer be able to overcome a test. However, if we overcome the tests now while we still have a chance then we will continue to be rewarded for the tests we pass even when there's no more Yetzer Hara. If now someone is confronted with a strong battle in Siniyut and they don't know should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't and they overcome it in the future there's going to be no more test but you're going to reap the rewards because you passed the test when you had the chance and this applies in all areas of Torah. Mashiach is at our doorstep. The Vilna Gaon says the biggest agony a person could possibly experience is regret. Oh, I wish I did it when I was able to. I wish I overcame. Oh, it was so easy. It was so easy. It says when the Yetzer Ara is going to be slaughtered, to the Rishayim, it's going to look like a little hair's breadth. That's all it was. Why didn't I just overcome it? It was nothing. It was all our imagination. Now is our chance, especially during these days. The Gemara says in Masechet Pesachim, there are three people that Hashem is machriz in shamayim bechol yom. He makes an announcement in heaven and he praises three people every single day. Who are these people? Number one, al haravak hadar bekrach ve'enochote, a bachelor who lives in the city and doesn't sin. Al ani. A poor man who finds a lost object on the floor and he returns it to the owner. And the third person is an ashir, a wealthy man who gives his ma'asir in private. These three people Hashem goes crazy for. What is so special about these people? All of these people have a very big desire a single boy a poor man who needs every penny he has money right in front of him he can just take it and a wealthy man who can get so much honor from his money and all three of them say I'm gonna overcome my desire Leman Hashem no one else knows no one knows what I'm doing I'm holding back from sin I could have taken this money, no one would have ever known. I'm giving my ma'asad in private, nobody knows what I do. Just me and Hashem. 
Hashem says, you only care about me? I'm going to announce you in all the upper worlds. I'm going to make such a commotion over you. Hashem loves when we have Yirat Shamayim, when we do things privately, just between us. The whole concept of Emunah, Bitachon, it's all in a person's heart. Nobody knows what we feel. Mrs. Rosenberg? No one knows about the... She has a flutter in her heart. She does it. It's only her. Hashem in Shamayim is Bohen Levavot. He knows our hearts. You know how precious it is? When you don't fear men, when you know he's in charge, when you don't blame the Shad Khanim, when you don't blame the boss, when you don't blame people and say, Hashem, I know it's you. When he tests your heart and you don't start palpitating because you know he's in charge. This is the greatest. He's announcing you in Shamayim. Look at her. She trusts in me. She knows I run the world and nobody else and she doesn't compromise her standards for other people. A woman was telling me, she just started saying the Amidah and the doorbell rang. She says, I was going to rush to go see who it is. And then I said, I'm talking to the master of the universe. I'm going to cut my, my talk short with him to go greet one of his puppets. And I prayed a great Amidah and I loved every second of it. People are not reliable anyway. Only Hashem is. Al tiftihu bin divim. I want to share with you a story recently happened. And I want to say thank you to Hashem publicly for helping me. Whenever I travel, I make it a point, I try my hardest to schedule my flights so that I don't have to miss minyan. <coughs> Making sure I arrive when I can go to a minyan, leave when I can go to a minyan. Recently I was somewhere out of the country and my, someone else scheduled the flights and I saw the return flight was 1 p.m. on Thursday. The minyan in the place I was at prays Shahrid at 8. I said, eight, one, perfect, great. The people call me on Tuesday. The driver is going to pick you up Thursday morning at eight. I said, what do you mean? The flight's not till one. I said, oh, oh you're, you're flying back from a different airport. It's three hours from where you are. I said, you kidding me? I need Minyan. That's the only flight of the day. You have to take it. What am I going to do? I go to the shul Wednesday morning and there's only 12 people in the whole shul. So I go to the Gabai. Maybe they want to pray tomorrow at 7? He says, no way. No one's praying at 7 here. I said, maybe they'll do it. Humor me. Ask them. He says, okay. After Shachrit, it was Rosh Chodesh. He gets up. Anybody here want to dive in tomorrow at 7? 7? What? Seven? No. Nah. He said, see, I told you. Sorry. No luck. I said, what's going to be? Maybe on the way to the airport. There's no minyanim for hundreds of miles. That's it. I said, Hashem, please help me. I try my hardest. Please. What happened? That night, 7 p.m., we had mincha. There's a, somebody else there, I said, maybe we'll ask again. The guy said, there's no way that they're going to say yes. I said, you're right, I don't need these people anyway. P.S., a few minutes after seven, some new people start walking in. One chassid, two chassid, a whole bunch of chassidim. I said, what's going on? They said, the grand, the Rebbe just landed here. I said, which Rebbe? The Alexander Rebbe. I said, who's that? Big Rebbe. 
I said, what is he doing here? He's here for the month and his, his, his Hasidim are arriving in shifts. We have seven people just got off the plane now with the Rebbe. We need Mincha and Arbid. We came here. This is the only Minyan in town. He said, what time is Bayriv? 9.30? Okay, we'll be back. So I go to them. I said, what about tomorrow morning? Tomorrow morning we have. People are coming in tonight. We're going to have 10 tomorrow. I said, where are you davening? He said, about a mile away. I said, would the Rebbe daven at 7? Oh, avada, Avada, 7, of course. I said, could I come? Of course, come. It's a mile away. It's a, we'll pick you up. The guy came the next morning at 6.30. He picked me up. I davened with the Alexander Rebbe and exactly 10 Hasidim. And I said, Yishtabach Shemo, thank you Hashem for sending me a minyan in the middle of nowhere. The very first Tisha B'Av came about because of a lack of trust in Hashem. The people were crying and complaining. They were crying, we can't beat these people, we can't fight the giants, the land is not good. And Hashem said, you don't trust me? You think I can't beat these people? It was a lack of emunah. The Gemara says, in order for the final Geulah to come, we need to rectify. It's going to be in the Zichut of Emunah that the Geulah comes. We need to make a Tikkun. We have to trust Hashem more. We have to believe in Him more. I speak to people. And people go through hardships, real hardships. And they say, I don't understand. You tell me Hashem is merciful. You call this mercy? Look at the pain that I'm in. Look at the suffering. How could this be mercy? How could this be mercy? You see my daughter. Everyone's married except her. How could that be mercy? Hard questions. Even Moshe Rabbeinu did not have the answer to these questions. It says when Moshe asked Hashem, Hashem said, come up the mountain. Let me show you something. Hashem showed Moshe at that time the following scene. A man comes to the river to take a drink of water and he drops his wallet on the floor, stuffed with cash. He walks away. A few minutes later, man number two comes. He sees the wallet on the floor. He puts it in his pocket and he walks away. A few minutes later, man number one comes back and now man number three is by the river. He goes over, where's my wallet? I don't have your wallet. Give me my wallet. I don't have your wallet. He starts hitting him. He ends up killing man three. Moshe Rabbeinu is in Shamayim. Hashem, where's the justice? How could this take place? Hashem said, you have no idea. You know, man number one stole this wallet from man number two. Man number two came and got it back. Man number three killed man number one's father. And now I brought it about that man number three should die. You think you have any understanding of this world? It's impossible. Because we have such a narrow view of the world. And even something that looks to us so cruel Look, he's crying all day. She can't stop crying. Hashem, don't you see her pain? Even that is unending mercy. <coughs> I read a story which took place recently. There was a little boy sitting at a kitchen table. Somebody poured a burning hot cup of tea, left it on the table and walked out of the room. The little boy grabbed the cup and he took a big gulp of it and he burned his throat and started screaming. The parents came, they called the ambulance, 
The ambulance came. They put him in the ambulance. They were going to take him to the emergency room. The kid was going berserk. He was screaming, screaming, screaming. The, scry the crying was getting so hard to even hear. His father said to the paramedic, could you give him something just to sedate him a little? Give him something. He said, I'm sorry. We're not allowed to do that. I said, please, look at him. He's screaming. Sorry, I'm not allowed to do that. A few minutes later, the cries became so hard. He said, please, just give him something. The father said, even a person with a heart of stone should have listened to me. He said, I'm sorry, I can't. We finally got to the emergency room. I asked the doctor, could you give my son something? Just calm him down. He said, of course. He gave him something to calm him down. A minute later, the kid starts gasping for air. He can't breathe. They quickly do something to him to get him to breathe. They put a tube down his throat. They open the air passage and they saved him. What happened? The swelling from that burn was so big. It closed up the airways of his throat. It was only the crying on the way there, the moisture that left a little hole open for the child to breathe. Had they gave him that pill or whatever they gave him in the ambulance, it would have closed and they didn't have the tools necessary to save him. The father said, I can't believe it. What I thought was the biggest cruelty, my son is screaming. They have a heart of stone. I said, that was Hashem's mercy keeping my son alive. We have no idea of the cheshbonot of Hashem. We don't know the calculations. But we have the ability to trust. It is up to us to say, I believe in you Hashem. I know this is your mercy. I trust you. You could have people who are praying day and night for something, wishing they could finally have it, but they're distanced from Hashem. They're praying, but they don't really have any relationship. They actually want to stop. They say, I can't dive in anymore. I want to just turn away. I said, isn't tefillah a connection to Hashem? Isn't tefillah bring the biggest connection? How could it be someone who prays multiple times a day could just totally shut down? The Pasuk says in Tehillim, Kefirim rashu vera'evu vedorsheh Hashem lo yachsiru chotov. Young lions become impoverished and hungry. But those who seek out Hashem never lack any good. It seems like from this pasuk, the lions are being contrasted to those who seek out Hashem. Which means the lions do not seek out Hashem. They can go hungry. But those who seek out Hashem always have everything. Yet there's another pasuk in Tehillim. Hakifirim sho'agim lataref the lions roar for their prey and they ask Hashem for their food which means they are seeking out Hashem so make up your mind are the lions seeking out Hashem or not one answer is the lions are definitely calling out to Hashem for their sustenance but that does not mean that they are Dorshe Hashem. They don't seek out Hashem. They believe He's in charge. They believe He runs the world. But they don't care to have any relationship with Him. It is possible for a person to believe in Hashem, to pray to Him, but have no interest in Him. All He wants is His desires to be fulfilled. Give me what I want. If you don't give me what I want, I don't like you. If you give me what I want, I like you. That's it. 
that person is davening to Hashem, but he's not a Doresh Hashem. A Doresh Hashem is someone who cares about Hashem. He's in awe of Hashem. He wants a connection with Him. He is not only motivated by, what am I getting out of this? And we can tell if a person is a Doresh Hashem when his will is not being fulfilled. Someone who's not a Doresh Hashem will turn the other way. Okay, I don't have what I want, I'll see you later. A Doresh Hashem gets even closer. Hashem, I trust you. I'm going to continue davening. I know you want the best for me. We are here to become Dorshe Hashem. We may have so many good reasons why we think we should get what we're asking for. It makes so much sense why we should get it. You know what a major problem that could happen when people's wills are not being fulfilled? I was talking to a boy. He's a little older, he's not married. He said, I cannot focus on anything else other than getting married. I can't learn. I can't be a person with people. I, all I want is to get married. That's it. And everything else in his life is shut down. Till I get what I want. The great Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who was in a cave for 13 years under the most dreary conditions, we could only imagine when he first went into that cave seeing he may be there forever he doesn't know he's running away for his life seeing he's gonna be without his wife his children he has one son away from his community and why did he end up there because somebody spoke Lashon Hara about him you know the natural tendency is to say do I deserve this Hashem do I deserve to be here if this guy wouldn't have said that, none of this would have happened. Hashem, please just get me out of here. 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 If he would have prayed 20 times a day, just get me out of here, it would have been understood. But he never would have become the great Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who we know, who produced the Zohar HaKadosh, that illuminates the world until Mashiach. Of course, he asked Hashem to help him get out. And I'm sure he could have had the greatest claims. Hashem, I don't want it for me. I want it for you. I can't even say Kiddush in here. I can't have my Shabbos meals. I can't eat the matzah on Pesach. I can't eat, I can't shake the lulav and etrog on Sukkot, I can't sit in a sukkah, I can't hear parashat zakhor. I want it for you. But if he would have spent all his time just wanting to get out, he would have done nothing. Instead he said, if I have to be here, if you didn't save me yet, that means I have to be here another day. And he sat down and he learned and he learned and he learned and he focused on Hashem and he focused on Torah. And in that difficulty was precisely how he became the great rabbi he became. His son-in-law asked him, how did you do it? He had cracks in his skin. He said, without these cracks, I wouldn't have become the one I became. You would think, He's such a holy rabbi. Why didn't Hashem just give him luxurious conditions in there? Make it nicer for him. Because Hashem knows what he really needed to become the great Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. We don't know what we need to become the people we need to become. But Hashem knows. I once read a mashal, there was a dove. This dove was the only dove without wings. 
all of his family members, his friends, they all had wings and every day they would fly over the world and come back and talk about what they saw and they would say, oh, it was so pretty this side and we saw this mountain and we saw this lake and this poor dove would just hop from one place to the next. He couldn't even walk straight. And every day he would cry, please, it's not fair, Hashem. Why do I have to suffer like this? It's bad enough, I can't fly, but I have to listen to everybody else brag about it. Until one day, Hashem answered his tefillah. And the dove woke up one morning with two black things on each one of his sides. The dove tries to walk and he can't, he's tripping over these things. He says, Hashem, it's bad enough, I can't walk. Now you make it even harder. And Hashem says, oh my precious dove, those things are not obstacles. Those are your wings. Start flapping them. You'll fly. You'll soar. We say sometimes, Hashem, it's bad enough this happened, that happened. Now you do this to me. Hashem says, my precious child, you don't understand. Those are your wings. Fly with them. Do what you have to do in this state that I'm putting you in now. We know things don't last forever. Things change. But don't ruin the opportunity you had at that time to soar to great heights with the life you were given. It may not be in the plan to be married at this time. It may not be in the plan to have money at this time. It may not be in the plan to have children at this time, but don't let that affect the rest of your life. You have a life to live here. You have a purpose. This world is a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. Don't blow it and say, till I get what I want, I'm going on strike. Hashem, it says in the Gemara, cries every single day three times over the Khurban. He feels so bad that we are exiled and he, he moans. But the Gemara says, when the Jewish people gather together in the Batei Knesiyot and they say, Yeheh Shemeh Rabbah Mevarach Le'alam Hashem says, look at my precious children. Look at how they praise me. I want them back. I want them back. Praising Hashem is so powerful. It causes Hashem to regret the Khurban. The Ora Haim HaKadosh said, Hashem gets praised every day from the angels in Shamayim, millions of them. They say, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. And Hashem enjoys their praise. But you know whose praise He enjoys even more? The Sadiqim who have passed on, who are also in Shamayim praising Hashem. He loves their praise even more than the angels. But you know whose praise He loves even more than the Sadiqim? The simple Jew in this world, in a body, who's covered, who doesn't see Hashem. A praise from us is the most precious commodity Hashem has. And I once saw from one of the Aharonim, he said, that's talking about if a person has everything going fine and he praises Hashem. Imagine the praise coming from someone who has every reason to complain. And he says, Yishtabach Shemo, Hashem is great. Hashem does everything for me. He's unbelievable. What a kiddush Hashem. What a praise. Hashem announces you in heaven. Look at my precious daughter. She praises me with all that's going on in her life. The Shomer Emonim, he writes in his Ma'amar and Hashkacha Peratid, he says, I want to tell you something that could make every little 
difficulty turn into the greatest avodat Hashem. He said, if anything ever happens that you don't like, you didn't want it to be like that, say the following, Ani ma'min be'muna shelema, I believe. I believe this came to me from you, Hashem. You did it. And I'm mekabel be'ahava. And you know why it came? Because of my great sins. Sadiqata Hashem. You are righteous. Va'ani hirshati. I know I deserve it. Whether it's something I did in the last life, whether in this life, I know I deserve this. Yehirat son, that this should be a kapara for my great abundant sins. I don't know which sins caused this, Hashem, only you do. Please wipe them away. Let this be a full kapara. Sweeten my judgments and sweeten the judgments on behalf of Klal Yisrael. He says, if someone says this, then Mikayem five mitzvot. Number one, believing in Hashkaha Pirati, that it didn't come randomly, it came from Hashem. Number two, being Matzdik the Deen. Like it says, Kika Asher Yaser Ishet Beno Hashem Elokecha Miyasereka. I believe Hashem, you did this for my best. Number three, you made Teshuvah. Number four, you made a request on behalf of Klal Yisrael, which is a mitzvah. And number five, you sang to Hashem under duress. Says the Shomer Emunim, you should learn this by heart. And if you say this Nusach, as nimtakim mimenu bezrat Hashem kol adinim, this wipes away all judgments. V'yitapechu everything litova, And the Yisurin will be a kapara. Because we accepted them the right way. Rather than complaining. We accepted them. And recognized we needed them. We have to love Hashem. We're going to read in this week's parasha. Ba'et Hanan famously Shema. I saw this year an explanation from the Ora Hayim. I can't believe I never saw it before. How much do we have to love Hashem? With all of your desires. He says, you know what that means? Imagine you desired something so badly, you would give anything for it. And you got it. What kind of love would you show for Hashem after getting that desire? You have to love Him as if you got that desire. Bechol nafshecha. Imagine a person was a lo'alenu on his deathbed and Hashem healed him. What kind of love would you have for Hashem? I just spoke to somebody recently on the phone. The man called me and said, on the night after the fast of Shiva Asar B'Tamuz, he was going to sleep at 11 o'clock and his chest was hurting. The pains got a little worse. His wife said, I don't want to take any chances, let's call Hatsala. Hatsala came. They wanted to take him to a close by hospital, it was only a few minutes away. She said, no, I want to go to this hospital. They said, it's far, that we want to go anyway. They went to the other hospital. They get there, it was chaos there, the emergency room was packed. They had connections, they made them, they finally got into a doctor. The doctor takes tests on him, EKG, blood work, everything looks fine. Nothing wrong with you. He had some pain, they gave him something for the pain, it went away said, we'll, we'll monitor you. They did another test at 3 o'clock in the morning. Same thing, everything fine. 8 o'clock in the morning, this is Friday morning, everything's fine. They're ready to discharge him. The doctor says, well, you know, I don't want to send you home. Let's just do an angiogram to be sure. He checks the schedule. There's 24 angiograms scheduled that day. There's no way he's going to get in. He looks at his watch, the doctor. He says, I can get you the first one right now. 
He says, they're pushing me down the hallway in my bed like a, like a man. They're rushing me. We go to the room. They do it. I come back into my room after the doctor says, I just want to let you know we just saved your life. He says, what? He said, your main artery was 99% blocked. We put in a stent and you had another artery 76% blocked. The main artery is called the widow maker. Because if it gets 100% blocked, you have a massive heart attack and the odds of survival are low. The man said, I had no idea of the danger I was in. He said, I walk four miles a day. I watch what I eat. I cannot believe this. And I just had a little pain. His cousin, who was a cardiologist, came to visit him. He said, I looked at all your numbers in the hospital from the test. It doesn't make any sense that they did that angiogram on you. You were fine. They should have sent you home. And that first hospital that they were going to go to doesn't even do angiograms on site. They send you out. There's no way they would have done it there. He said, Yishtabach Shemo. Hashem saved my life. He was on the phone with me in tears. I'll do anything for Hashem. I love Hashem. I have a new lease on life. And I'm thinking in my mind, this Ora Chaim I just read, this is how we all have to feel. Every day, Hashem, you gave us life. What wouldn't I do for you? How could I not do this? How could I not accept upon myself this added stringency? You give me everything. You give us life. You give us our desires. You give us money. You give us everything. And if you don't have everything you want, you have to imagine that you got it and love Him like that. If we could turn our hearts into our own Bet HaMikdash, the Bet HaMikdash was just a symbol for us to turn ourselves into a Bet HaMikdash. Our hearts are supposed to be the Kodesh Kodashim. When we make ourselves a Bet HaMikdash, Bivadai Hashem will bring back the Bet HaMikdash. Our Avodah is private, it's us and Hashem. No one ever has to know anything we do. Our feelings, our emunah, I trust you Hashem, I believe in you Hashem. I serve you. I want a relationship with you. I'm a Doresh Hashem. I don't just care about me. When Hashem sees our emunah, our bitachon, our avodah, how we want Him, we want to be close, Be'ezrat Hashem, we will see the coming of the Geulah. Be'merabi, amen, amen.